psychologist. I work as part of the community paid service uh, based on it. Ames Dell's probably most people know by now. Um, and I was asked to kind of come and um, chat about, well, I was asked to kind of chat about the emotional aspects of living with pain. Um, but as I think you've heard so far, it's not about splitting off the emotional aspects, is it? It's about the whole person kind of approach, the whole brain nervous system, and our emotions are one part of that. So I'm going to talk a bit about that today, I'm going to share some um, ideas of things that I've worked with people that I've kind of worked with, um, and yeah, throw a few facts in there as well, if that's okay. So, oh, I need to explain this. Hold on, hold on go back. Do you like the title? <laughs> so um, apparently, um, what they say, there's some research or something out there somewhere, that, um, that says actually people only remember three things when you give a talk, so these are three things that I want you to remember. Daleks, and there's a bit of a big clue over there in the corner, which some of you might know a bit about already, and we'll come on to that. Um, dominoes and donuts. So they're the three things that I want you to kind of take away with you today. So, without further ado. So, what do we know so far? And how amazing is it now that my medical and physio colleagues, they talk about psychology. Psychology isn't just for psychologists. Psychology is for all health professionals because, you know, my argument would be that's what, that's what makes us human. We're working with human beings. We're not working with um, just one bit of somebody that's gone wrong. We're working with the whole person. So it's lovely to hear so much psychology in, in the, my teammates' talks. And, and not surprising because I'm, we've kind of worked together for a while. So, pain is a sensory experience produced by the brain. The experience of pain is a complex mixture of a range of inputs from the nervous system, which Dr. Barker was talking about, nociception, and neuroception. So neuroception might be a word that you've not perhaps really come across, and, and it's a fairly new word, actually, in the literature. Um, I'll read it out. It describes how neural circuits distinguish whether situations or people are safe, dangerous, or life-threatening. And it's a constant process of perception and evaluation. So it was alluded to in the previous talks, but the word that pinning on it is neuroception. And apparently it explains why a toddler enjoys a parent's embrace, but views a hug from a stranger as an, as an assault. So it's like that sixth sense we have, that kind of feeling of whether something's safe or not. That kind of sixth sense. And then um, it's, a, it's a real complex process bi-directional processes of, you know, messages zipping around, all processed by this really, really complex computer, which is our brain. Um, and some of this is a new conscious control, and some of it, some of it isn't as well. The meaning of the pain is important, as Graham and, and Chris described, the context, um, whether it's perceived as a threat, whether it's understood in different ways, and that can lead people to function differently. Pain is the brain's response to what it thinks is a threat. Its function is to motivate a type and set of behaviours. Okay, so that's a little bit of a kind of summary of, of what the guys have told you, with this new term kind of thrown in. Has everybody ever seen him before? <laughs> Aristotle, apparently. So he's uh, that Greek guy that lived a long, long time ago, isn't he? Um, isn't it interesting that in Western medicine, certain, certainly for a while, but I think we're getting better these days, uh, brains and bodies were treated as separately. So um, if you have something wrong with your stomach, you go to the stomach doctor. If you have something wrong with your leg, you might go to the, I don't know, the broken bone doctor. But actually, right back with the ancient Greeks, they treated uh, people as whole whole beings, and they knew that the brain was always talking to the body and vice versa. And I think um, kind of traditional medicine has kind of lost sight of that for a while, but now in recent years, we're kind of tying everything back together, especially with all this new evidence we've got about the nervous system and the brain. Aristotle apparently called, described pain as a passion of the soul, and that pain is linked to emotion. Again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but maybe Aristotle said it first. <laughs> so, the other thing to say, um, just going back one, sorry. Um, everything affects everything else, doesn't it? So Graham talked a bit about vicious cycles and things setting off kind of negative triggers. Well, actually, that also means that we can build positive cycles, and that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit more about as well. 
Um, we talked about the brain's plasticity and how it has the ability to uh, tread dominant and less dominant paths. And we're going to talk about a bit about that as well. Next slide. Right, did you know this? So, this is um, a functional MRI study. So they put people in these really fancy like brain scans they've got these days. And apparently, when people feel emotional pain, the same areas of the brain get activated as with physical pain. Did you know that? That's pretty striking, isn't it? So, basically, the bit of the brain that lights up when they put people in a sc scanner and they induce emotional pain. So, one of the experiments, I thought it was a bit tight, actually. So, what they did is they got people who um, have recently been dumped. They've been in emotional relationships and they got dumped. And they got them to think about the rejection, think about the emotional pain, basically. And also, so they scan them, that's the bit of the head that's lit up. Um, you want to know it's the secondary somatosensory cortex and the dorsal posterior insula. Don't ask me to say that again. Um, so that bit lit up, and then what they did is they um, also kind of triggered a, a more of what you might call a physical pain. So kind of uh, the hot and cold thing that can induce pain, and the exact same brain areas light up. So we know that these pathways are just so, so, so linked together. We're not talking about separate things in terms of, of the brain. Um, and they think that during the course of evolution, the brain and the body took the economy route and decided to use a, a, a single neural system to detect and feel pain, regardless of whether it's um, emotional or physical. Does that shock people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you learn something. <laughs> so, do you want to yeah. This slide just has a few words, a bit like um, when. Chris was talking at the start, he popped up that picture of uh, the person like hunched over with all the barbed wire um, riddled around them. And we know it's incredibly, incredibly hard to live with chronic pain. It's very challenging. Um, and these are the kind of feelings that people often talk to me as a psychologist about. They talk about feeling angry, feeling frightened. Some people talk to me about feeling suicidal, that they just feel like they can't go on with this, this pain in their life. Uh, they feel sad, worried, nervous. Uh, they feel kind of cloudy and foggy in their heads because we know that chronic pain affects our attentional processes. So um, one kind of um, famous psychology lecturer said he, he was trying to kind of get an audience who didn't live with pain to think about what it might be like to live with pain and the way it interrupts your attentional skills. And he said, try and think about listening to this lecture, but someone is constantly poking you in the back, trying to interrupt your thought processes, trying to interrupt your world, interrupt your, your kind of what you're trying to focus on. So yeah, so we know it's usually challenging, not only from the emotional side, but from the cognitive, the attentional side. Um, also, there's the word unheard. A lot of people that I work with feel unheard in terms of their pain. They feel that they've been around the block in terms of seeing people and they don't feel understood. Actually, some people have talked about being actively dismissed, you know, that pain's all in your head. And hopefully, although I'm kind of talking about, you know, the brain and the nervous system, we all are, we're not saying it's all in your head, you've not, you know, not made it up. It's actually part of the way the brain processes pain and that doesn't show up on these fancy scans in some ways, although we're, we're getting there a bit more with that. Um, what else have we got? Debilitated. I feel unfixable. I feel I feel crazy. People say, oh God, I think I'm going mad. I can't remember anything. And that's because, yeah, pain does this inter has this interrupting kind of quality. Um, so we know as well that um, in a chronic pain population, there is a higher prevalence of anxiety and depression compared to... Um, and I use inverted commas, you know, a normal population, a population without chronic pain. We know there's higher rates of anxiety and depression. And no one quite exactly knows which way around is it. Is it chicken and egg? Is it that people have already got a level of anxiety, depression, which is gets through the roof, you know, when they've got chronic pain? Or is it the impact of chronic pain that, um, that winds those systems up even more? So it's a chicken and egg. It's a, you know... The studies haven't totally um, figured out which, which way around it is, but we know that actually it can be a multitude of, of factors. Um, in basic terms, it's really hard to live with chronic pain. 
So one study says that there's double the amount of anxiety disorders as the normal population, and some studies say there's 60% of anxiety in the chronic pain population. Um, again, going back to the Greeks, I quite like this, this quote. It's some guy called Epictetus. Anybody heard of him? I'd heard of Aristotle, but not this guy, Epictetus. Um, it's not pain or death that is to be dreaded, but the fear of pain or death. So our, again, our emotions, our thought processes can make difficult circumstances worse, worse or better. Um, I guess as a psychologist, I'm often, I get these referrals from GPs. Please see so-and-so, they're struggling with this pain being around in their lives. Um, please teach them resilience or take away their depression or take away their anxiety. And if only if it was that simple. Often the people I work with are living long term with pain and it's about trying to live well despite that being around um, without always necessarily taking away the pain but we know people can live better despite pain and I'm going to talk a bit more about that as well. I guess as well I don't teach people to, to do that. I kinda, I'm really curious with them about what they know already about doing that and we work together on what they want to work on. So I don't do like a, you know like an appendectomy where you take the appendix about don't just kind of magically take the anxiety out, take the depression. Actually, it's part of living with a chronic condition quite often. Um, so some, some people do live well with pain. Some people create lives with meaning and cope with the symptoms. And we might ask how. So this slide is a, is a kind of series of words from uh, what people kind of often talk to us when they've uh, kind of gone on a journey with living with pain, either with us or, or through, other, through other means. Um, there are ways that people can feel successful again, useful, confident, happy, hopeful. Hope, I think, is a big thing. And often, often we talk about, you know, I can't see any light at the end of this tunnel if this pain's not going to go away. But what if there was light in terms of living a better life despite pain being around? What would that, what would that look like? And hopefully we're going to have a couple of stories today about a couple of people that have made that happen for themselves in their lives. Um, compassion is a, is a great one. So often people tell me that when they learn to be a bit kinder to themselves, they feel a little bit better because people are hard on themselves. We beat ourselves up. We're actually evolutionary designed to beat ourselves up because we want to stay in with the, the in crowd, the impact. Um, and it's like a bit of a default, you know, like a defensive kind of thing. It's trying to keep us safe. So we beat ourselves up to try and do better. But actually, that's not always the best way, is it, to, to feel better? Um, people talk about having a sense of purpose, a sense of joy again, a sense of feeling assertive, taking control again. That often has great power. So I'm going to get on to my three Ds of my talk now. So do you want to flip the next one up? Daleks. I love the Dalek story. Um, so some of you might have heard the Dalek story already, but I've um, got a special guest speaker tonight. Kev, do you want to come up? Yeah. <laughs> so some of you might know Kev, and some of you might not. It might be the first time you've heard him speak. Um, but Kev's going to explain explain why we've got Daleks on our slide and why we've got Daleks here today. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my name's Kev Howard. I've lived with chronic pain for the past 18 years. Um, life was horrendous. It was more than horrendous. It was absolute crap. Um, I was focused on all the negative things I was doing um, and I couldn't focus on anything positive because the pain was so bad, sort of I couldn't kick a football around with my son, um, I, I couldn't sort of fall out of trees with my either, that was pretty annoying. Um, but some 12 years ago I was referred to the community pain service, um, Dr Chris Parker helped me with my medication. And he suggested a chat with a psychologist might help. I thought to myself, I'm not mad. This pain is very, very real. Um, but I would try anything at that stage. Um, so after a long chat with Becky, um, she suggested I try and set small goals and perhaps also long-term goals. Um, and she also suggested about think about what you can do. And this is quite important. Rip the microphone off. <laughs> Those, these particular words. Think about what you can do. 
So I tried to stop thinking about the stuff I couldn't do, football and stuff. I thought, well, what can I do? Because it was always very practical. Um, I wanted to do something with my son, um, as well as teach him practical skills. So he was an avid Doctor Who fan, so I asked him, should we build a life-size Dalek? He said, yes, can we, Dad? He, I couldn't believe the excitement in his face, and I still remember it today. Um, he was only six. So I found plans on the internet for the Dalek. Um, looking at the plans as a whole, the Dalek would be a mammoth task. I'd better bring him over, haven't I? Uh-huh. She hates Daleks, put it there. <laughs> so, so, so you're looking at it, you think, I'll never be able to do that. But I thought about what Betty had said. She said, break things down, set small goals. So I looked at it again and I thought, well, actually, that's loads of little goals. That's a little project, that's a little project. That's a little project. So, me and my son, we did each one of these over, I think it was about three months it took. Um, and it was brilliant. He was doing father and son stuff. Um, I've got a memory like this here, but I blame on dedication. Um, <laughs> so, Stu helped make it. He was sanding away, cutting his fingers. I said, Tony, the Lord, there's a plaster. Um, he, he learned how to use tools, so it was great father and son stuff, and we were interactive. Um, I hated football anyway. Uh, <laughs> and just on a final note, I always used to feel guilty about not being able to do sort of outdoor activities with my son. Um, and he made a random comment last month, which pretty much choked me. Um, and bearing, bearing in mind he's now 21, he said, Dad, you've done so much with me. Far more than any of my friends' dads have ever done with them. So remember, never give up. Thank you. Can I make you stay up here a little bit longer? <laughs> Can I ask you, um, what, did, what difference did it make to you to be asked to think very carefully about what was important in your life and what you were really hoping for? Yeah, I think it was blinkered. Um, I wanted a magic pill. I wanted to take a magic pill and say, okay, your pain's gone, you can get on with your own life. But that wasn't going to happen. But I went round in circles looking for that answer. Um, and the more the, the, the health professionals said, I can't help you, I can't help you, the more angry and frustrated I got because I thought the technology today you must be able to fix me. But I finally accepted that I wasn't going to be fixed and then focusing on the things that I could do made a big difference because I was always very practical so that I could virtually build anything. And that all seemed to have got pushed to the back of my mind. Um, yeah, it's like you've forgotten. Yeah, I've forgotten. The, because the I was, strengths that you have. I was blinkered into finding a cure or finding a fix yeah. and everything else just went by the by. Yeah. So in your experience, it was helpful to look at. It was very helpful. What, what you might be hoping for. Yeah, it's something that won't happen overnight. It will take time because you'll be thinking, oh, I could do that. But you're on, you're on the flip side, you might think, well, shit, it's going to hurt. But you'll find ways around to maybe take it longer to do some things. Uh, because in the great scheme of things, if something takes twice as long to do, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And what difference does it make to how you feel to change your mindset? A uh, sense of achievement. Um, I'm so much more laid back now because if I wanted something, if I wanted to do something, it had to be done immediately. But now I think, well, if I do it immediately, I've got to be dead for two days. So I'll just break it down into little jobs. Thanks, Grim indeed. <laughs> so. The, the Dalek is really important because it represents that. It's so important to ask people what's important and meaningful to them. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that Kevin was good at building Daleks. I, you know, I didn't know that. But actually through a conversation where we really had to think about, well, what skills did he already have? What 
he was not where his best hopes. His best hopes were to spend quality time with his son, and he came up with his solution. And, and that's what intrigues me. Everybody's solution is, is different, and it's not something that I can kind of come up with for them, but through some careful thinking, we can come up with perhaps together. Um, just put one back. Um, so, and it's not just kind of me saying this or people like Kev saying this, there's a lot of research out there as well. Actually, people are engaged in positive goals. It predicts higher levels of psychological well-being. And actually, there's some evidence that it can mediate um, pain severity and pain intensity. So it can, can have a bit of a positive side effect on pain. Building a goal doesn't take your pain away, but it arguably helps you live better with your pain. Would you say, Kev? Yes, that means a good distraction. Yeah. And that thing, that the distraction thing, so you remember the thing that we said about actually when you hit your thumb with a hammer and you shove it under the coat tap, what you're doing there is you're distracting your nervous system and what you were doing there, kind of rebuilding the dial and focusing your concentration that way, which you were distracting your nervous system. Right, so moving on. Um, so, I think, I think as well, Graham, you, you said this one earlier, didn't you? So, it's actually my boss, Dominic, who says this one. Uh, it's long down the golf course if you don't know what you're aiming for. So if you're stuck in problem land and all you can see is the problem, you can kind of lose sight of where it is you're heading. And that's not a really, that's quite a tough question that I ask people. What is it you're hoping for from working with us in the pain service? And it can take a bit of thinking about. But if we're not asking that, how do we know where people are heading? How do we figure out that they're headed for Dalek land, you know? Ah, and this is another bit of interesting research. So actually, it was a study that was published in the journal Pain, um, and it was a 15 minute task, and you had to write about your best possible self for 15 minutes. I think they did it like every day. So they were invited to imagine their best possible self happening. So just imagining, just using your brain's imagination, whether, it, whether you think it can happen or not, it actually is irrelevant. It's about getting those brain neural networks working again. So rather than them just totally being obsessed with problem land, inviting the brain into possibility land, and actually what they found was that um, they got lower pain ratings, and the authors thought that the pain experience was lower because participants paid less attention to the aversive aspects of the painful experience. And that, that research has been duplicated as well in, in various studies. So actually a process of visualising your best possible self can make a bit of a difference and can boost your optimism and happiness as well. So that sounds all right, doesn't it? Um, do you want to flip on? So my second thing was dominoes. So inviting people to notice and make small cumulative changes. Do you want to flick it on? Um, there are the dominoes. So um, one small change can often lead to uh, wider successes in different areas. So for Kev, it was one small change that he actually got his, his brain into gear in terms of possibility and creative land. That led to literally building a Dalek that involved uh, building a more positive relationship with his son. And that is still paying dividends all these years later. So one just little flick of the domino can lead to all sorts of changes. Um, and it, do you want to flick it on? It reminds me of the, um, that's Team GB cycling team, you know, the ones that won all those medals at the 2012 Olympics. Now, apparently, I know nothing about cycling, but apparently how they did that was they shaved little opportunities in every aspect of their experience. So they kind of improved the bikes a little bit, they improved their diets a little bit, uh, they maybe coached in different ways, you know, they kind of tweaked a lot of different areas and all those little tweaks in those little areas added up to a significant change, which was that massive medal haul. So often what we do at the pain service is we invite people to notice their smallest successes, however small, because if your brain is cued into doing that, Success can breed success. I thought this was quite a nice quote. Uh, chronic pain is not all about the body. It's not all about the brain. It's everything. Target everything and take back your life. Next one. And donuts. Donuts is my last D. So donuts represent... Again, I make this from my boss, Dominic, who also begins with D. <laughs> um, notice the donut and not just the hole. As humans, we've evolved as a species to look for what's wrong, 
where's the threat, what's wrong? Because that's how we've survived and kept safe all these years as a species. But it doesn't help us in facing some of these situations we find ourselves in in modern life. We forget to notice, well, what's going right? What is there? What's, the, what's going on? What's the fleshy part of the donut? I'm going to notice that, not just the whole. So it's an invitation, really, to, to notice your successes, however small. How do you get out at all? How do you even get up in the morning? Do you give yourself a pat on the back for that? Notice your qualities. Uh, people say, oh, I'm determined because my mum always was determined. Oh, right, tell me about that determination. How does that help you these days? Noticing how people are getting through. We invite people to think about, well, what do they already know about living despite pain? Because we meet people with lots of experience in the room of pain. Uh, I invite people to notice any L'Oreal moments. See the adverts, what do they do? They like flip their hair, don't they, and go, because I'm worth it. Yeah. Do we do that enough? No, no, I haven't got it. I haven't got the hair. <laughs> um, notice existing resources. Um, in each other and in yourself. Do, do you have to sit and do that? I don't know. The other, the other D we've got, I think, ah, this is Mark's going to do us a little talk. So, um, oh, shoot, and why did why we put that under D? Um, why have we put that under donuts? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, just... Again, noticing what, what we've already got, really, I suppose, noticing what's there and what's missing and what really interests me, um, particularly myself and not being a psychologist, is what interests us um, is actually existing expertise that we've actually got in the body that sometimes, and I've got to be honest as well, I was completely unaware that we had until the start of this job. And what we can talk about sometimes um, is a built-in soothing system that we've got in our body. So if you think about Chris and Graham's talk, and just previously, about the amount of threat that our body can sometimes experience, particularly when the pain response is there. You know, we need to be a little bit curious sometimes of how we're gonna sort of upset the balance of that and get that soothing system going as well. Because again, what we do now, what Graham and Chris did mention, is if that soothing system switched on, that neural pathway, again, that he's questioning, tell us what's going well, can open up that pathway as well and begin that soothing response. You know, it's no coincidence that, you know, Kev built a Dalek, um, is engaged with his son, and that's initiated the soothing response. So, just got a little bit of information here just to, to finish off, um, is around mindful living. So, just to show hands, has anyone ever heard of mindful living or mindfulness or relaxation? Okay, so plenty of hands in the room, one back there as well, fantastic. So, plenty of show of hands there. Um, and the reason that this is often mentioned around pain is about turning that soothing system on and attentional training. Now, what I would say as well is to sign patients who are expert patient Mark Fletcher here as well, who talks very well about this attentional training and how to do mindful living and how it impacts um, on his pain. Um, so, again, this is about challenging the autopilot that we can sometimes have. Again, it's evolution. We are trained to look actually at what's going wrong, what's the threat. Of course, our primary response to pain is exactly that. Um, and again, when we go to health appointments, they sometimes open up in that threat response way. What's wrong? Rather than what you've been pleased to notice. So again, anyone in the pain service over the appointment, it is around that as well. Let's turn that soothing um, response on. Excellent. Um, so there was just a really quick study I just wanted to bring your attention to. It was around people who um, were meditators, people who meditated um, regularly. Um, compared to people who went into meditation. And the really interesting thing here, it's a really interesting study, but just running out of time, I'll just take you through it quickly, um, was around actually the people who were more experienced meditators had rewired their brains and developed a different response to the presence of pain. And what they looked at is it is the sensory cortex. Again, I'm sure Chris gives a bit more info on that. But this is the area of the brain that perceives pain. Um, obviously that lit up, pain was still present. But again, we spoke about that emotional component as well to pain. When people were meditating and had been used to meditating as well, um, the amygdala, so that emotional response to pain as well, as we know we go hand in hand, and that was a response that actually stayed calm. So that's a really interesting story there of how we can sort of, yeah, access that, that way of plasticity as well, sort of noticing that the brain can change. This is what meditation, uh, relaxation, breathing and attention exercises can do for us. 
And just a quick one, just looking at an um, MRI scan. This is actually a really recent study. I think it was sort of published in the last sort of two weeks. And it's a really striking image of how we can look at areas of the brain that can impact pain, particularly through the, um, the sort of method of touch. So this is a, I think it's a two-month-year-old baby in an MRI scanner with mum. And if we move on the scanner, we can uh, look at the areas of the brain that are lit up when this happens. And self-compassion, so again, that ability to be self-compassionate to ourselves, but also to others around us as well, through touch, through things that we say to ourselves, through things that we say to others, can ignite um, oxytocin in the brain, um, which helps balance cortisol, which is in relation to the threat response as well. So we've got a really nice sort of combination here of um, good biology, good psychology, um, and sort of a good mishmash of the both. Next slide, please, Beth. So really, you know, just sort of final thoughts from myself, I'll hand back to Becky to finish. It's really just a bit of a, a mission for everyone here in attendance, really. That's if you choose to accept it. It's just a bit of brain gardening. And that's due to breath works from Manchester. Um, and really it is about you know, noticing um, soothing moments, noticing again what's going well. Again, rewiring our brain really to be you know, attentive and notice those moments as well. So I've rushed that last one a little bit. Um, but please grab yourself or a colleague at the end of the time this a bit of depth. Thanks, Mark. Isn't it interesting? I, I feel like the neuroscience is like catching up with some of the psychology stuff we've been doing for a little while. What do you, what do you say? Because, so the mindfulness stuff as well has been around for years and years. I mean, it's got its roots in Buddhism, and now the neuroscience is coming out to kind of back up why that is helpful for lots of people. Um, the final slide, really, is a summary of, of the talk around building well-being despite pain. And these, again, are some of the ways that the people that we've worked with have got to know over the years, quite often. Um, have started to live well. So some people talk about, you know, I've started going out with my friends again. I've learned to say no when I needed to say no and look after myself a bit more. I've started a project. I'm building my confidence. I've found a role or a purpose. Um, I've matched my goals to my strengths. I've looked at what skills I already do have and what can I do a bit more of and matched it up rather than trying to be a square peg in a round hole kind of thing. Like, like the football example, you couldn't do the football, but you found out what you could do was build the goal. Um, I dared to dream, you know, I, I challenged myself a little bit. Uh, singing in a choir we've got, because there's a well-being choir in there. One of our volunteers who was manning the tea and coffee, she is heading back, so she could tell you more about that and the difference that's made to her in living with pain. Um, yeah, so all sorts of ways people, when they start to just put one foot in possibility land, their worlds have grown a bit. It's not a fix, it's not a cure, it doesn't take pain away. Quite often the people I've got to know over the years, they still live with pain, anxiety, depression. They were only human, but they've built their well-being up alongside that as well. And life feels better. So... Thank you for listening. And um, next up, actually, we've got it from the horse's mouth again, haven't we, Luke? <laughs> Not that you're a horse. <laughs> um, we're going to have Luke come in and tell us a bit about his, his journey. Like.